Well, it's, it's a pleasure to be back here. I really love this conference uh, for so many reasons. So thank you for the organizers uh, for inviting me. Uh, it's also always a pleasure to follow Leon uh, as he is, is a, actually a true gem in the world of dermatology, phenomenal speaker, has been an Obi-Wan to me of sorts over the years as a, as a great mentor. So we're gonna shift gears and uh, you know, I'm, I'm gonna kind of make a, a slight promise to you that this talk is not going to be looking at you know, new and emerging data from phase three programs or talking about the latest and greatest of drugs, but rather taking a step back and thinking of simple things you can employ in your practice to ensure better management and, adhere and adherence for your patients, as well as talk about maybe some drugs you don't necessarily think about when it comes to the management of this extraordinarily disabling disease. These are my disclosures, though I don't believe any are relevant to what I'll be talking about today. So I, I think we have a lot of easy opportunities to improve the, you know, the, the experience of our patients. And so we're gonna dive into each of these easy E's. Um, anyone here a big fan of old school rap? Hopefully, Let's see. Don't lie to me, I know you all love this stuff. Um, so we're gonna try and dive into some of these things, once again, to really help ease the burden, because especially with that new atopic derm patient who may not even know that terminology, doesn't even know what they have, that could be a lengthy first visit. And I do encourage you to try to spend a lot of time with these patients, whether it be with the patient or the patient and their family, uh, because it will save you time on the back end, but also these are lifelong patients. If you do them right, they will stick with you, they will send their friends and family to you. Uh, so if, even from a business perspective, it's really important and it's a really good idea to invest in that time. So first and foremost is education. We'll go into that. There's so many things you need to educate these patients about. This is a little different, I think, from psoriasis nowadays, because I think psoriasis patients, having been kind of biologic exposed, whether they're on it or not, but just exposed to that world, uh, or even small molecule inhibitors, they've heard it all. A lot of them know about psoriasis. Maybe they don't have a complete definition, but I think it's very different for atopic derm, where even a lot of our adult patients who develop it for the first time as an adult, they're like, I can't have eczema, that's just for kids. So there's a lot of opportunity to fill in gaps here, um, and I would, absolutely recommend using uh, various tools such as handouts to make that discussion easier, as well as to have it be long lasting in the sense that about maybe 20% of what you're gonna say in that 45 minutes potentially will stay in here versus the rest will literally drip out the other side. So giving them a, a plethora of homework to read at home will also limit the number of callbacks you get. Expectations is a big one, we'll get into that with respect to especially topicals, in terms of what can you expect from a treatment and then knowing full well what the expectation is, that will improve adherence, but also what expectations can you have for what comes after? In terms of, for example, if you treat something, will that skin look normal after you're done? Depending on scenario, possibly not. And so making sure a patient understands what that's gonna look like is really going to improve the likelihood that they're gonna stick with whatever you're saying and with you. Um, I like early uh, re uh, returns for especially the new uh, moderate severe atopic dermatitis patient. Um, I know it's hard with our busy schedules, but especially for those AD train wrecks, having them come back in three to four weeks does a lot of things. One, it tells them you're invested. You know, you want to make sure they're doing better. And I will put a little asterisk on that is that you can use your EMR to do that and saying, hey, in two weeks, send me a message. I want to know how you're doing. That can kind of be on the spectrum of having that early return. Um, but also what it does, and Steve Feldman has shown this, it ensures adherence. Because it's like, you know, going to the dentist that, you know, you space that out once a year, about a couple weeks beforehand, that's when you really start brushing your teeth with great regularity. Don't lie, that's all you do it, um, including myself. But um, I think if you have that kind of narrow time frame in terms of when you first see them come back, the likely they'll stick with your regimen or will get an appreciation for whether that regimen works or not, uh, certainly uh, will, will come, to, come to light and then you can kind of revisit and regroup at that next, uh, next visit. And of course, giving enough of whatever you're giving, we'll get into that as well. So I think we need to really spend some time educating what this is, what it isn't. But I think one of the most important things is explaining how insanely common this is. Atopic dermatitis is the second most common inflammatory skin diseases. It does not discriminate. It affects all age ranges. It's not just for kids, as I, I discussed. And actually, more recent data shows that of adults who have this, almost a quarter of them get it for the first time as an adult. And so I think those basic facts that you are not alone, this is super common, and because of that, we're learning a lot and doing a lot for it, but also just because you are who you are means that you can or cannot have it, we need to dismiss those myths. 
I think we also have to talk about the kind of heterogeneity of disease. And now we're kind of moving towards this concept of the AD spectrum. Kind of like with rosacea, how instead of having the distinct pillars of rosacea types, rather it's like essential or important features. AD is even bigger than that because there's so many different morphologies that really come into light depending on various demographics. And so it's all atopic dermatitis. So we really want to be inclusive to not miss some of these, these elements of that spectrum. We want to educate on what they're doing on a day-to-day. -day. Soaps are niche good for atopic dermatitis. Even the mild soaps are still soaps. And so my, my mantra is if you are flaring no soap, regardless of what soap to that area, however you want to talk about why some soaps may be okay when things are stable versus others that can actually cause problems. And simply switching from a basic to a neutral or even a mildly acidic soap can have a tremendous impact on the disease course. Um, and, and to kind of think about that, let's look at some of those traditional soaps in terms of their, their pH. Um, you know, some of them are as high as 10 or 11. You have to remember the skin's natural pH is somewhere between five and a half and six and a half. That's acidic. We know that atopics has a shift just at baseline. They're more neutral, which also allows staph to grow more easier. That's why we see more staph colonization. So to throw that in a soap that will push it even further into the basic territory is going to make things worse. So we need to be very purposeful about soap selection. What about bathing? Um, I mean, ideal world, I would like my patients to just sit in plain water in a bathtub, get nice and pruney, and then grease up afterwards. That's not always feasible. And I would argue it's probably more the exception than the rule. However, uh, we need to also guide them if they're even just simply in the shower. No loofahs, no scrubbing, no rubbing, no peeling. Keep it simple, soak and smear minimize soap use. Moisturizers are so central to what we do. Regardless of the severity, if you look at the AD yardstick paper from 2018, um, no matter how bad they are, what else, you're doing topical systemics, moisturizer, a molly use is part of that process. And you want to have a moisturizer that does it all. You want one that's gonna soften the skin, trap water in the skin, a nice occlusive agent. I personally like the, um, the, like the, the silicone derivatives, dimethicone, cyclomethicone, because they're occlusive but not obtrusive. They're not greasy, they're not thick, they're not gonna stain everything. And then a humectant to pull that water in. And I've given some examples of ingredients that you and patients can look at on the back um, to, that they should look for when I identifying uh, a moisturizer. That said, Everyone's skin's a little different, let's be honest. So what I like to put on my skin, even if it has all three of these things in there, these three categories, it may not play nice on other skin. And that's where I think samples are very helpful. I give more samples of moisturizers to 80 patients than sampling of anything else, because I want them to try the ones that I think may work for them out. Um, this could also include ones that are meant for eczema under the over-the-counter monograph, FDA monograph, that has colloidal oatmeal, including these things. Um, so I, I really do take the time to uh, make sure that uh, the products have what, what they need to have in there. But you want to give them a couple options so they can pick what makes most sense for them. We also want to start early. There's evidence showing that if you have a high-risk infant in a family member or a family that has uh, a lot of AD, this could possibly prevent AD or prevent the severity AD in that kiddo. Um, and we know that just simply putting on a barrier can change the biology of the skin. So there's a lot of evidence behind this if a patient needs to hear it. We also want to educate on comorbidities. This was a patient who was getting light therapy uh, for her AD, and I got pulled in because the nurse said, oh, she got a, a burn from the UVB. Definitely not a burn. Definitely not a burn. This is eczema herpeticum affecting her eye. This is a medical emergency. Um, so it's important to talk to patients about because of how their disease works, what it does to the skin, the immune environment, what that can mean in terms of other things like eczema herpeticum. It also highlights how undertreating and not following directions can actually lead to complications such as these. So we know cutaneous, cutaneous infections is increased across the spectrum um, of, of all, all types of AD and all types of infections, viruses, uh, fungal infections, uh, bacterial infections. So that highlights why it's so important to stick to the regimen uh, to limit these specific comorbidities. And since I bring out Exa Herpeticum, I do in the handouts have the dosing regimen. I personally prefer Valcyclovir a little easier to dose versus like the 20 times a day for Acyclovir. Um, and there are gonna be patients that who will need to be on suppressive therapy because it keeps happening and happening. And that's a lower dose of 500 milligrams of Valcyclovir a day. And that can make a very big difference in terms of preventing infection. So you cannot ignore the comorbidities, just like psoriasis, just like hydradenitis, just like so many inflammatory diseases. There are a plethora of uh, comorbidities, atopic dermatitis, which then once again argues that treating this correctly could possibly mitigate or even prevent them. 
We also want to acknowledge the impact on quality of life. This is an opportunity to engage the patient and really partner with them to say, I get it. I know how this could affect your life. And, and obviously, it's going to be a very wide spectrum depending on age, what the patient's doing, their job, their social life. But just acknowledging how impactful this can be that you know this, the patient very often feels un, 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 ununderstood. They don't feel like anyone gets what they're going through. Not that we do if we don't have their condition, but at least we have an understanding based on the data and our own experiences. So just acknowledging, like, this must be really hard for you. Are you sleeping? You're not, that must be, I, I love sleep, that must be horrible. Just kind of saying those things will get the patient better on board with your management strategy. So let's talk about some uh, topical therapy uh, tools to maintain that adherence. So we gotta talk about clearance and maintenance. And one of the biggest mistakes I think that's made is a topical is given, the patient's told to use it for two to three weeks, they get better, and then they stop. And surprise, surprise, it comes back because this is a chronic disease. And so the patient's thinking like, that topical didn't work. It failed. Though it didn't fail, it did what it was supposed to do. They just didn't understand what the next steps were. So you want to talk about clearance, and then you want to talk about maintenance, whether it be with reduced dosing of a topical steroid, whether it be um, proactive, you know, preventive therapy with a non-steroidal, which we now have three different classes of, which is absolutely amazing, um, two of which are relatively recent in the last you know, decade or two. Um, so I, I think that there are options to not just get rid of, but keep away. And that's the mentality we need to really think about. What about this patient that we hear from all, from all the time? I've tried everything, it doesn't work, nothing works. Always ask these three questions. What did you use and for how long did you use it? How much of it did you use and did you stop and just give up, uh, give up hope thereafter? Because I think that you know, there are so many ways to optimize that if the person before you did not go over these basic things in terms of how to use it, for how long to use it, when to start again, or what maintenance dosing, that may be the trick to get this under control. And so when I think about potency, I, I, I tell patients I want to hit them hard. You know, because I think when we think about the side effects of, for example, topical steroids, skin thinning, atrophy, that comes with time, not with potency. So if we hit them hard with something stronger and get them to clearance faster, the likelihood of side effects is actually less. So we want to put that fire out quickly. We don't want to let it go on and on. So I say go strong or go home. We also know that's safe to do that, that you really have to go against the ISI and the, the directions in that giant thing you fold out from the box to really cause uh, systemic problems. And this really nice study from Tino Batani's group showed that patients would need to use more than 50 grams of an ultrapotent topical steroid to then result in maybe adrenal suppression or insufficiency or, or systemic absorption. So patients would really have to be abusing to really uh, cause problems. But along those lines, I know we're scared of that. I know we hear about you know, systemic absorption. Patients are scared of that. Um, and so we give smaller bottles and smaller tubes. And that's part of the adherence issue. Because you give a little tube for a BSA of 50, they burn through that in two days. Guess what? The medication didn't work. Because they, they went through it, they used it, and it didn't work. So we need to make sure that we're giving topical steroids in the amount that is needed and thinking about what steroids come in larger tubes or even jar sizes. And so in the handout, we don't need to go through this uh, at nausea. Um, there are various ways to think about how much you need based on body surface area uh, and for duration of, of treatment. And there's the fingertip unit, BSA, lots of things you can think about. The other thing in terms of adherence is telling someone to apply something twice a day, very easy to say, rolls off the tongue, it's another thing to do. And, and you have to think about this, you're putting something on twice a day, is that going to play nice with the clothing? Is it gonna be apparent? Is it a hot 95 degree pure humidity day where an ointment's gonna feel absolutely awful? So there are some simple, simple things you can think about. And a lot of this twice a day dosing is not because you need to do it, it's because that's what the clinical trials did. They were just banking, like, oh, we should just do twice a day. Why not? Sounds like a good idea. And so a lot of, there have been studies since, you know, the kind of question was raised, do you actually have to do twice a day? Meta-analyses, Cochrane reviews that show once a day is probably equivalent. And so I bring that with patients, like, you can use this once a day. You don't have to do twice a day, and that might make it a little easier as well. Just some updates on safety and, and conversation on safety. Um, you know, obviously uh, the, uh, the calcineurin inhibitors have that black box warning that we've been kind of mocking for years now, but we have data showing that there are no post-marketing cases of lymphoma from patients who applied it to their skin, can't say anything about eating it, but I hope patients are not eating it. So I think we can breathe a sigh of relief 
You know, I think also with safety, especially with some of the newer agents like topical jack inhibitors, you know, there's a lot of scary, you just saw it from Leon, there's a lot of scary stuff in the ISI, not specific to topical, but it's a class labeling. So I think just be prepared to talk to patients about the safety issues, even if they aren't issues, because you don't want them to gain that information from someone else. You don't want getting it from the pharmacist. You don't want them getting it from online or Dr. Google or even from the product insert. So I always say get ahead of it, create a script to keep it short and sweet, but get to the point of what the true safety issues are, if there are any. Now, before you go to systemics, kind of what I was alluding to before, make sure the patient has actually been optimized on topicals. That's where those questions can be so helpful because maybe they're just not doing it right. Maybe they weren't guided appropriately. You know, get maintenance therapy with a non-steroidal or infrequent dosing of steroids on board. Also make sure you have the right diagnosis before you start throwing systemics at them that could actually make that other diagnosis worse. So along the lines, a practical tip from the access world. So PAs are the bane of our existences. Um, these hurdles put before us to get patients medications. And so documentation is so huge when it really comes to this. So first and foremost, make sure you're documenting it's the right condition. And insurances want to know that an expert is making that assessment. And we are the experts, right? But make sure you're documenting in a way that shows that you know what you're talking about. Make sure you're documenting by the surface area, the severity of disease, and also what patients have failed in the past. Now, we don't have validated clinical tools to really document this. That's where your, you know, you know, your lexicon, your verbose, you know, description of the case is going to be so important. Or you can use some of those research tools. Now, atopic dermatitis, as I mentioned, is heterogeneous in its presentation, comes in a lot of different flavors, and so it can be difficult sometimes to make that diagnosis. So with that in mind, we're going to do some OG ARS, where I'm going to ask people to shout out, which one do you think is atopic dermatitis? A or B? Don't be shy. A or B? Any A's? I'm going to do like a Jedi mind trick. You will answer the question. <laughs> Damn it. Why does it work? So the answer is A. So those, you know, those little vesicles is that those spongiotic vesicles on the foot, whereas B, very well demarcated, you can even see the nails are involved, that's tinea pedis. Which is AD, A or B? Shout it out. I heard some B, and that is correct. So that's numular dermatitis, those kind of numular subtype where A was tinea corpus, which uh, obviously a KOH can help make that distinction. Which one is AD, A or B? I think I need hearing aids. I'm gonna assume everyone said A, which is follicular eczema, those innumerable little white papules involving the follicular ostia where B is like in planus. Which is AD, A or B? And I think the point here is not you need to get this right, but highlighting that this is not easy from a clinical perspective. Just looking at AD and the wide diversity of presentations, this is not so easy. So B is AD, A is hypomedid MF. So, but the whole reason here is we want to end the misdiagnoses. This was a patient being treated with clobetazole for allergic contact dermatitis, not so much, positive KOH, and I love me some KOHs. So use the tools before you to make the right diagnoses. Another practical tip with PAs, once again, make sure you document, document, document. What have they failed? What is the body surface area? What IgA are they? You know, those are simple things that can then fast track those approvals. Now, I'm going to wrap up with uh, some talks about systemics, but not the systemics you're thinking of. Things to really manage itch or things that you should not be thinking about to manage itch. And let's start with antihistamines. Yes, these knock people out. They make them drowsy. It can help with sleeping. But histamine is not the problem with itch and AD. So the problem here is patients sleep, but they scratch in their sleep. Now, you can say, well, that's fine. They still get some sleep. Is there any harm to this? The answer is yes. You know, these drugs are not necessarily benign. They have anticholinergic effects, and there may be some association of inappropriate use and the development of ADD and ADHD in kids and dementia because of anticholinergic effects in adults. And there's data showing that these are used and abused even though they don't really work. So just say no. Now, how fair is that to me? Say, hey, don't use antihistamines. Suck it up and deal with paritis. Well, I got a lot of tools and toys for you to play with. Obviously, those in bold, the anti-inflammatories, will address itch from the anti-inflammatory perspective, but we have a lot of drugs that can inter interfere with the propagation of itch signals. 
This is a nice figure just highlighting the mechanisms by which a lot of these both FDA-approved and emerging therapies work and how they can then ultimately impact itch. So I think there's a lot on the horizon, a lot we already have from the kind of true AD anti-inflammatory perspective, but there's some other things you can do as well to get that itch under control yesterday. So I use a lot of gabapentinoids in my practice. We have a gabapentin and pregabalin. Pregabalin's a little more expensive. Both are controlled substances. The way I use it is I slowly go up, but there's a very high ceiling. The max dose per day of gabapentin is 3,600 milligrams. I start patients on 300 and work them up to 900 over a course of several days, and we go from there. The problem with gabapentin is that patients develop tolerance, and that's why you have the dose escalate. The only scenario you have to be really cautious is uh, with renal impairment. They have to go very low dose. Uh, but I think it works really well. It works very quickly. So I have a lot of my patients with really um, you know, resistant itch on, on gabapentinoids. Bertazapine is another one. And this is interesting. The lower you go, the more sedating it is. So I start patients on 15 milligrams. And then if they're not zonked out and they want to be, I go lower. Or if they are at 15, I go higher. Uh, once a day dosing, I usually have them start on a weekend in case they get knocked out. Does have a black box warning, which I don't buy, but also can really help with itch. Doxepin, I don't use that much of, but I think I kind of laid out here how to use it. I use it more for urticaria, but it can help with itch as well. It's very potent antihistaminic properties. Uh, there are a whole bunch of other SSRIs you can use. Once again, I put the dosing here just for you to play with, but my first line are typically the gabapentinoids. Now, Traxone, I do use every so often, uh, opioid mod modulators. There are some coming out specific for itch. I start low because of the GI side effects, but also the really funky dreams these patients get. So I usually do a, a half a pill, 20, you know, I do like 12 and a half, um, and then kind of work my way up. But I find this usually more effective for cholestatic uh, pruritus or renal pruritus, but I have used it in some patients uh, for itch that doesn't respond to gabapentinoids, for example. So here's some data showing that. Last but not least, in terms of your ease, make sure that you are getting your patients better and documenting it. Because yes, you've done all this to get your drug approved. However, if you're not showing the drug is working, insurance is gonna say, well, why are we spending all this money if it's not working? And then they will pull it back. And there are a lot of ways you can document. Patient is happy, patient is sleeping, all these things. So need to document or else. And last but not least, engage assistance. NIA, wonderful organization, handouts, tools, you name it. They even have expos for patients. So make sure to check them out online. And with that, my time is done.